What is up, Luca Nation? We uh, we have a young collector here. Someone that you know from a little bit of talking to him. He's uh, he's a smart guy. He's got a good Thank head you. on his shoulders. I'm young. I'm smart. I'm loving this, man. This is amazing. You said such nice things about me. No. Oh, that's the intro. You were talking no, about no, me. No, no, no. I thought we were doing this whole popcorn oh, thing where where well, you I, cut me off and uh, you I, run with the intro. You know, for once, deep. for once, I thought. You were saying nice things about me. You know, young and smart and handsome and not making fun of my T-shirts, you know, my vintage T-shirts. But, hey, listen, if we talk about Frank. Do you win yesterday's uh, edit for the end of uh, the collectible episode where I said I got to give a shout out to my (laughs) co-host? So we'll we'll, we'll wipe that right under the rug. Under the rug. This is someone you know. What have you done I guarantee you. This is somebody you know for sure. Uh. You know, before we jumped on here, I said, Frank, like, I, I remember your page, Capri Cards. And then you changed your name to, oh, that's you. And you put out some of the best, you know, daily videos of just, like, kind of quick hitters of, you know, this is what I'm seeing in the hobby. This is what I'm doing. Maybe you should, you know, take a look at this. And what do you think? So talk to me. How did you start with this whole uh, content creation journey? This is going to be a collector's episode. But I do want to hear your journey into the sports cards and into the content world. Yeah. So I appreciate you guys having me on. I've been listening to you guys for a while. So I got back into sports cards, you know, early on when I was in college In high school, I didn't do sports cards at all. Did a little bit when I was a kid. My dad was really into it. But I think like the perfect story that shows how I wasn't into sports cards like three or four years ago is when I was graduating high school, my dad took me to the NBA finals, uh, game four of the NBA finals in Cleveland, LeBron's last game playing for the Cavs. And that's right by the football hall of fame. So we went to the football hall of fame and they had an exhibit there where they had like a rookie card of like every single NFL Hall of Famer. I remember my dad was like so excited about it. Like, look at this. I could, I, I genuinely couldn't care less. Don't know why. Just wasn't a fan of it. Wasn't thinking about sports cards. You know, went into college, always knowing that, you know, my goal was to like work for myself, to do business, to find something I was passionate about, but didn't know about sports cards. And I would say heading into the 2018 NBA season, so like two and a half years ago, three years ago, I saw Gary Vee talking about sports cards. I got into it. You know, nothing crazy off the jump. Literally went on eBay buying like RJ Barrett based prisms, Luca based pr- like Luca based prisms, just like messing around a little bit. But once COVID happened and I was flipping for like six months and doing sports cards, it gave me the ability like all day, every day. This is literally all I did. And from when I got started to when last Labor Day, all I did was flip. I didn't do content or anything. All I do did was flipping cards, but I didn't have a crazy bankroll. And obviously last summer when the NBA bubble was going on, a lot of prices crashed and stuff. I didn't see personally a great opportunity to just always make money flipping. Like it, it's easy to flip cards when stuff goes from 20 bucks to 40 bucks to hundred bucks to 200 bucks. You, you couldn't lose. Like literally I remember before the bubble buying Michael Ford junior cards for 40 and selling them in the bubble for like 400 bucks. That's not sustainable. But I was Amazing how many geniuses there are out there, right? When the market's going. Yeah, every, everybody's a genius in a bull market, 100%. <laughs> but I got to that point, and I was still early on. You know, I was really only just flipping, like, base cards, silver cards. I didn't have a crazy, like, understanding of the market in general. And I got to the point where, like, I want to learn more. And I kind of felt, looking for resources, there was a couple people in the industry that I was looking at. But I'm like, I feel like there's a lot of things in the market that isn't being discussed enough. So I kind of just ran with it. I started writing a daily email. And people responded well to it, did that for like three months. And by the time we got to last December, I started doing Instagram videos daily. Remember, I did it like the first second time. Didn't expect anything up, just tried it out. And people really enjoyed it. And ever since then, I've been running with content. I found that just talking about sports, talking about cards, like the relation to like fantasy sports is something I'm incredibly passionate about. And that's where I'm at. Long ramble, I guess. But I I was a collector and... I ended up finding out that making content, you know, I'm a lot more passionate about that. And I see that, you know, more long-term. Were you sneaker flipping before this? Like, were you collecting shoes before this? At, back in middle school, I was, I was, I was heavy in sneakers. Um, I, I was flipping sneakers, doing all that kind of stuff, but it wasn't something that, that I was genuinely passionate about. It was something, you know, just making money. And once I got to high school, I kind of stopped that. I was solely focused on like playing basketball and stuff that I didn't think about anything like that. But what, what I'm hearing and why I wanted to bring Frank on is, you know, we had the captain on, we had Miles on. You, Frank, I mean, Frank, you're 21. You look older. I mean, I'm sure you've heard that before. You probably could get at the bars at, at 18, 19 years old. Uh, but 
you are the new generation of collectors, right? And I'm curious, you know, why do you think so many young kids are getting into shoes, into cards, and NFTs, into collectibles? What's moving them in that direction? Uh, I, I think Gary Vee has made like entrepreneurship cool. Like I, I don't think like 10 years ago was the same thing. I think everybody kind of wants to be able to do stuff independently and such. And that's like what all my stuff is catered to. And a lot of my followers in general, you know, it's people that just love sports and it's people who do sports betting and such. And I personally think that sports cards can provide you, you know, a, a better opportunity to make money. And I think people have realized that. And I think it's fun. I think just younger people realize that they realize that there's a business model behind it, obviously, which is the reason why a lot of us are here. But at the exact same time, it's fun. So I think I think there's a path for people that aren't involved with sports cards that are young to genuinely enjoy it. Cage, why did you get into collecting cards? Uh, everybody on my block did it. You know, all the kids were going out there with, uh, you know, with their with their baseball cards. It was a cool way of you know, collecting something of somebody that you loved. Uh, you were a fan of somebody, you, you know, you got it. I got that cool one with, you know, with Don Mattingly, 85 top second year where he's, he's about to run, you know, from first base to second base or, you know, the, the Daryl Strawberry with his cool swing or, you know, that kind of stuff. Like, you know, it was – and what's funny about it is over time it actually became a flex, but it was only a flex on the block, not a flex on Instagram to, you know, thousands of people. It was like, all right, you're the kid who was able to go out and get the Ken Griffey Jr. 89 upper deck. I just was able to buy the Fleer, you know. So there was always that, you know, that that trading, that show-offing stuff. But it was, <laughs> it was not, uh, it was not like it is now. Now people are building businesses around showing stuff off. So, but Frank, listen, I love the story, right? Because, you know, it shows. I don't know if there are people just wired differently, or this is just now the way things are. Um, we've gotten over the last 500 episodes or however many we're up to now, we've gotten to talk to so many people who just say, Hey, I always knew I didn't want to work for anybody. I always knew I was going to find a way to do it. And, and clearly it's, you're not blowing smoke because in middle school, you know, when you're 13 years old or 14 years old, you're flipping sneakers, but that wasn't going to be the end game. Now, part of that might be because it was harder to do because a lot of people got in it. But the other part is it wasn't what you were passionate about. Right. And clearly it seems that the cards are something you're passionate about. You, you can't write a daily email without, you know, being passionate about that. Like, okay. Otherwise you'd wake up one morning and be like, I'm not doing this. this, and, this I did it, and I did it for months and months without making a dollar off of it. Yeah. I mean, so you have to be passionate about it. And I think that really does, that does, you know, shine through in, uh, you know, in what you do. Um, so, yeah, I mean, thrilled to have you on, thrilled to have you on kind of represent like the new blood in the hobby and, you know, I like talking to people like you because, you know, you weren't in it just because dad did it. You know, you had a chance to do it and go to the, you know, I, wish, Canton, right? I would have a lot more money right now. Right, I right. So, yeah. I mean, like, you know, and now maybe you're able to buy, I don't know if you do football or maybe you're able to buy a, a you know, a, a, a rookie card that was on display there and show it to dad and be like, hey, I didn't care then, but check out what I bought now. You know, that's a cool thing, almost like a cool little come up. Um and speaking of which, do you just do basketball? You do all kinds of sports? What do you do? So I love basketball as a sport way more than any other sport. I, I've been drawn to that ever since I was really little. So, yeah, I definitely collect basketball at the highest level just because all my favorite athletes are basketball players. But besides that, football is my second favorite sport. I'm, I'm obsessed with fantasy football and stuff. So do football, a little bit of baseball, like a little bit of soccer and stuff, but primarily basketball. Do you Right now, if, you, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if you're in the market – Herbert Mahomes, you buying or selling individually? Who? Uh, Herbert, I actually like right now more than I thought. I was never the biggest Herbert guy all off season. I was kind of talking about how the gap between Burrow and Herbert, I didn't agree with. I thought Burrow had a decent chance of catching up. I, I do think Burrow's great, and they're what three and two. They're they're playing well, but what Justin Herbert has done this season is showing that he's a stud. Now I was writing about this this morning that like. For the last couple of years, the narrative has been that Patrick Mahomes is by far the best young player in football. It's not even close. This guy's going to be a top three player of all time, like easily. And now I think there's a realistic conversation that obviously Patrick Mahomes is the most talented player in football. But but look, guys like Josh Allen, guys like Justin Herbert, these are really serious guys. And I think if somebody said, I looked this morning that uh, Josh Allen's gold prison rookie card PSA 10 sold for $18,000 back in Jan just, just January. I, I think if that went on golden auctions right now, that's going for over $100,000. Timing, timing, you know, next year, Josh Allen might take, you know, take a step backwards. 
You know, there was a time people don't remember this because everybody's window of memory is, you know, the last week and the, and the next week where everybody was all over Lamar Jackson because Lamar Jackson won the MVP and, and Mahomes didn't. And Lamar was going to be the next big thing. And now now people are not on Lamar Jackson. Yeah. So I, mean, I, I think I think the big money is scared to get involved with, with Lamar. Just seeing guys like you've seen Michael Vick before, obviously, like, like you see that that playing style isn't sustainable. And the way Patrick Mahomes is, he's the most naturally gifted passer of all time. He has Andy Reid, who's like the best offensive coach ever. So people just think he's going to be able to sit in the pocket for 20 years to do this easily. First three seasons he started, he got to at least the AFC championship game every, every single year. Everyone just assumed like they're going to be able to win five Super Bowls easily. Now, would I panic sell Patrick Mahomes cards right now? Obviously not. I, I'm sure he's still going to end up having the insane career. But it's a serious conversation that there's a lot of young talent in football. And just to assume that everybody's going to roll over and just hand it to the Chiefs every single year, it's not going to happen. What if, what advice do you, you share or what suggestions do you share, you know, on your weekly, your daily newsletter, your, your daily videos, you know, you're speaking to this young 18 to 25 year old crew who, like you mentioned, you know, they want to be entrepreneurs. They want to live life on their terms. What, what are some suggestions, advice, you know, recurring themes that you might want to share with our audience? Yeah. So, so the number one thing you should do is when you first hear about sports cards, get excited for it. The number one thing you shouldn't do is like stay up all night on eBay, just buying random cards because that doesn't end up well. And that's literally the first mistake everybody makes. If they get excited, they start buying cards and they buy junk. And I think for the people that get involved, I think it takes a level of discipline to get involved and listen to stuff, listen to your guys show, listen to content in the space and, you know, watch the market for a few months, you know, think about cards you might potentially want to see and see what happens to them. But I think a level of patience is 100% necessary because the one thing I don't want to see happen, and I've been doing tons of content on this recently, is highlighting things in the market that aren't sustainable because I want people to see, I don't want, I don't want somebody to get into the industry, get excited, put $500 in sports cards, and they buy into hype. They buy Trayvon Diggs, Silver Prism Autos right now for 10X of what they were a week ago. That card goes down 85% in two months, and that person needs to hop. What I want to see is people genuinely finding a path in the industry where they have their niche, they know what they like, they are able to time it, make money on it, but it's something sustainable long-term because I want to look five years from now and I want to see all the people that I'm talking to in the industry right now, I want them to be here. I want there to be more people. You know, I, I want this industry to grow. Not everybody can make money, though. There's two sides of every deal and the market can't keep going up. So that makes it very difficult. It makes it difficult to, uh, you know, continue that. Um, so I guess it's good what you're trying to do is educate folks. It is a very important lesson, right? Because you get excited about stuff and then it's like, all right, I'm, I'm jumping in. I'm jumping in. It's very difficult to take that pause, you know, that look before you leap. So if that's what you're preaching. That's, I mean, that's a yeah, very you're good thing. You're not going to win every single deal, every single card you're not going to be right on. But it, it, it can be rational, right? Like if you're, if you're FOMO buying something that's 5X of what it was a month ago, that's something that 99 out of 100 times doesn't end up working out well. Now, I'm sure that there's, there's players that I've invested in. There's players I'm sure you guys have invested in, like young players, but you bought them when they were a reasonable price, and they just didn't end up being what you hoped. Now, you're not going to win on everything, but I think you should be going into every single play with a rational mindset of why it might work out. How about taking profits, Frank? It's one of the things I don't hear anybody talking about anymore, right? I mean, you gotta you got to take some money off the table. You, you preach any of that to you folks? Yes, yes, and I, I, think, I think we learned that. When we looked at February, March of last year, I think there are a lot of people holding cards today that wish they sold back then. And, you know, I, I think if you two or three extra money on something and you're hoping for it to go up 10% more, you're in the wrong sell. And, you know, a lot of the dealers and a lot of people that I'm close to, the ones that are successful, they get something, it goes up, they move into something else. They're always churning and making margins rather than, you know, holding something and, you know, flipping every once in a while. The people that I see that are making a lot of money are the ones that are, you know, seeing right now, a couple weeks ago, they were buying basketball cards for everybody else. Now I'm looking, the volume on basketball cards on eBay is a lot higher than what it was a couple months ago. You know, the people that were buying basketball then and, and selling it right now are the people that are going to win more than the people buying basketball today and trying to sell in two weeks from now because I'm already seeing people flooding the market with base cards of basketball. Everybody's thinking the same stuff. So I think you need to be ahead of the curve or you're going to get hurt. Thinking ahead of the curve. So, like, if I was a collector – you had a great post here. It was the Trey Young Optic Hollow versus the Trey Young Prism Silver. And basically right around the same price, the, the Prism was 1600 bucks. The Optic Hollow was 1300 But the pop count was, you know, 159 PSA 10s for the Hollow and 2000 over 2000 PSA 10s for the Prism. You know, if I was a collector, would, it, would collectors get the Hollow? And is it flippers that love the Prism? 
what's that disparity? You know, what's that discrepancy? You had a ton of comments. Digest it yeah. for us. Yeah. So everybody just assumes that Prism is king. If anybody enters the basketball car market, what's the first thing they, they get shown? Every, everybody says Prism, 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 right? And that's why everybody talks about it. The most easy parallel is the silver, right? But I think a lot of people came into the industry with the assumption that that card is rare. The silver Prism PSA 10 is a rare card. It is not a rare car by by any means. So I think the industry has just gotten so used to it. But I, I don't think that's a card that long term holds significant value. It just can't. There's too many of them. Like every single car show I go to, I see 20 silver PSA 10s of all these young players, right? Whereas if you're looking from an actual collector perspective, there's only what a couple hundred of the hollows for for Trey. There's not that many collectors that are going to be able to actually get their hands on that. You know, it's, it's just a different mindset. And the one thing people always said was. Optic will never be able to compare to Prism. So I did another post after that showing Trey's Hyper Prism PSA 10, which is the Pop 28 relative to the Silver Prism PSA 10, which is like Pop 2100. And the Hyper sells for less. And they're both Prism, and the Hyper is way more rare. And if you want to just tell me that, you know, the eye appeal of the basic refractor makes it worth more, even though you could literally get like 75 of the Silver PSA 10, it, it's crazy in my eyes. I mean, Cage used to tell me no one liked the Hyper, and then... After a little while, the hyper started catching up because of the low pop. It, it was just where people were chasing alpha, I think, is, is like the whole summary of it. It's like, you know, it became so saturated on the prism base and the prism silver, people started looking for an edge and looked for the hyper. Yeah, and, 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 Go ahead. yeah, the one thing I will say about Optic is I've seen a lot of breaks where people bring on like professional athletes and they'll put prism, Optic, and Select right next to each other. And more times than not, these people are saying that they think that the optic or the select looks cooler. So I think from a perspective, if you're a collector, and if I could be getting a card that's more rare and a card that I believe is visually more appealing, I'm going to take that option rather than just buying the prism because everybody tells me that's the better option. I love it. The only problem I have with it is the liquidity of it, right? So I think what makes the silver prism go is there's enough people out there saying, look what I got. Look, this one's worth this. And look what I got. And they hold it up. And I got the silver one. And then people who are coming into the hobby who follow those people are like, oh, I want to get that one that that person has. You don't see a lot of that whole like follow train type of stuff with optics and selects and, and that kind of stuff. And I think that a lot of that has, you know, that, that stuff, it's what, dri it, what drives the hobby. It's what's driven the hobby recently, you know? I mean, you brought up Gary, right? I mean, you know, people were paying more for the Mookie Betts update paper than they were paying for the Mookie Betts update Chrome because he held up the paper one. I'm not going to say that's why. That's no, I can, I'll that never prove exact that. thing would happen with Kevin Durant. Gary Vee posted the White Tops border Kevin Durant rookie card, and those aren't even in packs, right? Yep. You, you, that card becomes packs. The, the and no, yeah, nobody packs. knew about – nobody was talking about the black border, which I remember they were selling raw – you know, right when COVID started, like March of 2020, I remember Gary Vee posted that. You could have got the black ones for pretty cheap back then, too. But yep. everybody ran and got the white border one that he posted. And look right now, if you bought the white border, you would have made money still probably based off then. But not even close to as much as if you were actually buying the rare yep. card. Same thing. The chrome the chrome is, uh, you know, the, on Moogie Bats is it far outpaces the paper one. But there is a lot of monkey see, monkey do in, uh, in, what, in what we do here in the hobby. It really is. Um, and I think the... That that silver prism, it just it's kind of just become that that bellwether card for folks. Um, you know, entry level. Who do you want to get in? Oh, I want to invest in DeAndre Ayton. I'm going to grab the prism silver. It's just kind of like, oh, go ahead and find that one. That's what you invest in somebody, and you can see if it's going up. You can see if it's going down. Whereas, you know, an optic hollow, you might put it up on eBay, and you don't know what it might sell for because there's just not a lot of them out there, and you got to wait. It's not exactly a liquid thing that you can value. So. Frank, what's your? I, I saw your video on uh, Michael Rubin, and when he was on CNBC, you had a little bit of a recap. You know, all right, we, we've spoken with some big wigs, and they've had their PR, PR prepared statements for what's going to happen when Fanatics uh, comes into the hobby. But, but what's what's the youth? Because because truthfully, uh, and sorry, I'm putting you to sleep, Kate. Yeah, man. You um, it, man. Uh, what's the youth? Because if you're 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, in five years you're going to be 25. Right. And if you're 25, you're going to be 30. So you're kind of that's you're going to have disposable income. Right. What is your generation saying about this fanatics move? Are they excited? Curious. Yeah, I think most people are nervous in general. And my my personal opinion on this the whole time is just, you know, wait and see. Uh, I think when I heard Michael Rubin talking on CNBC, personally, I was a little weary of it. And honestly, it really should be, be me. It should be all the businesses in the space. 
because he flat out said that whatever you do, whatever you do good at, we're going to come and try to do it better than you, right? It's not like we're just going to manufacture cards and not even just, we'll just sell it direct to consumer and we'll make a spread, you know, taking out card shops, taking out distributors. They said, we're going to have a secondary marketplace for you to sell your cards. So looking at guys like eBay and stuff, that's a direct competitor. We're going to grade the cards for you. So you look at Nat Turner, what they're trying to do at PSA, they say, we want to grade your cards too. We want to vault cards. The Fanatics wants to do everything. So I think what makes me scared as a personal collector is I, I hope that they have at least some competition so they don't get lazy. I think we could all agree that Panini gets lazy. I just posted on Instagram an hour ago an autograph of uh, Brandon Clark where on the back is Brandon Clark and on the front it's an autograph of Kyle Guy. Like stuff like that, like terrible quality control. I, I think we could all agree that that's the case with Panini. And I think somebody else coming in controlling every single sport, I, I think it should make people weary for at least the true collectors. But wait and see in general. I'm not going to sit here being all excited about it necessarily, but I'm not going to hate on it until I get the details. Are they the competition though? Like, right? Like we say competition's good. And he's coming in here saying, I'm going to compete with all of you. Maybe he is the competition, right? We look at him as the monopoly or Fanatics is the monopoly. Maybe they're the competition, actually. They're the ones that are going to shake things up. I hope so. As well, a they're, they're not going to have competition from the angle of manufacturing the cards. I'm excited as if I'm a collector, right? Because they, first of all, he's not going to come in and say, hey, by the way, they, you know, we, brought, we spent all this money, um, and we, but we know we can't do this better than the people who already exist. Like, that's just not the way things work. They got to come out there and say, no matter what it is, from A to Z, we're going to do it better than everybody. Right. But as a collector, you know, Fanatics, if, if I'm able to look at it, and we haven't had them on. If they want to come on our show, that's great too. But after I say this, we might reduce the odds. I think they might be biting off more than they can chew. Right. They're going to go out there and say, we're going to do every one of these phases from A to Z better than everyone else. Okay. Well, eBay only has to focus on being a secondary marketplace. Right. Fanatic, yeah. you're gonna you're gonna manufacture as it is. <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna manufacture the cards. Okay, so maybe you'll be better at manufacturing than the manufacturers. Then you're gonna distribute the cards. So maybe you'll be better than distributing the cards than the distributors currently are, right? You're gonna deal the secondary market. Okay, maybe you'll be better. You're gonna grade. Okay, maybe you'll be better than the people grading the cards. Am I really supposed to believe that none of those standalones can figure out a way to be better at their one piece of that equation than Fanatic is gonna be on all of them? So to me, this is a whole craziness. Like, you, you, you can't believe what they're saying. They're not going to come out there and be like, yeah, you know, we spent all these billions, but we know we're going to suck at A, D, and L on this chain. So we're not even going to try those. Of course, they're going to come out and make these bold statements about how they're going to change the whole thing. But ultimately, when it comes down to it, it's happened before, you know? And if you're in the right stuff for the right people, you know, nobody cares when they're holding a Jerry Rice Tops rookie card, that Tops lost the license. It's the right card. It's the right player. Nobody cares holding a Montana rookie. If you if you're holding the 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 Tom Brady, you know, playoff, you know, autograph, the the, the contenders autograph ticket, you're not concerned that Fanatics is now gonna be doing the cards. Like that's the right card. It's the right player. You know, like obviously that's a huge card. I'm just, I'm just trying to make an example here that yeah, I mean, change happens. It's happened almost every decade, basically. You know, it happened when Panini came in, in, in you know, 10, 10, 12 years ago. So I'm not concerned about it. Yes, I know what you're saying. It's be concerned if you're one of these, you know, supply chain people. But let's see what actually happens. Well, if, you're, if, you're, if you're a card shop, you should be concerned 100%. So that's up to the card shops, right? I mean, it comes down to complacency. And I mean, I did, I did a live, you know, quick, quick little hitter with like 15 people in it from my local card store. And, and someone in the chat was like, hey, ask your, ask your LCS guy what he thinks about Fanatics. And he's like, I'm not worried about it. People want to come to a card store and buy their cards. But that's yeah. it. That's his answer. But, but, guy, but his, a, card shop, a card shop makes a lot of money when they get their allocation and they get it for way under what they actually sell it to their customer. Yeah, I mean, the boom of it, right, it's probably not going to be there, you know, but certain card stores, like my guy, gets a tiny allocation anyway, so he's not, you know, he's not making millions of dollars, a little hole in the wall, you know, it looks like the place exploded in 1983 and he never cleaned it up, but, you know, I mean, it, you know, it's, 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 yeah, I mean, I guess if I were one of the top card stores doing millions of dollars every week on my allocations from, from the distributors and from Panini and the whole nine yards, sure, I probably would be a little concerned about the shakeup of it, but, you know, that, the gravy train that is the hobby can't last the way it's been going for a while anyway. It just can't. 
Yeah, I, I think I think the biggest thing is just for whoever's in leadership to care about what true collectors want to say, because I believe as long as the people that genuinely enjoy collecting are involved and engaged and excited, then we'll be good. I think when I saw, I don't want to put anybody a blast or whatever, when but Josh Luber or whatever is going to be running this whole entire thing, he came out with the idea, like, wouldn't it be really cool if we put a sticker auto in every single pack and you could put an Alex Crusoe autographed on a Zion Williamson card? Like, and I saw Nat Turner responded to that, like, no, that, that's a terrible idea. But I just think, like, I, I think stuff works in the hobby, and I just hope that whoever's running this stuff genuinely listens to what collectors enjoy the stuff that works. And So, so Frank, yeah. it's a good question, right? So, so, so I'll take it two ways. One, you have to remember um, that – the voice of the collectors, there is no voice of the collector, right? There is no, um, like, let's listen to what the collectors have to say. There are millions of collectors and all of them have their own voice of what they like. You know, I mean, there are a lot of people out there who, if they could have one wish, it would be that fanatics bought the rights to kaboom and put it in their product. Whereas my group of people, just me by myself, an army of one, would not buy a Fanatics product if it had kaboom in it. You know, I mean, so like, you can't just say, oh, let's listen to what the collectors want. That said, if you were in charge, if we, if we now knighted you, Andrew takes his sword out, he has like a crazy sword collection. Sometimes he wears nothing but like a suit of armor and walks around Mexico with these swords. If he's going to knight you, Sir Fanatics, he's going to put the sword on you. He's going to say, you are the ambassador to Fanatics, right? And you get a window of opportunity with Josh Luber, and Ruben, and, and Captain Fanatic, and whoever else is in charge over there. And you get to sit down for five minutes and tell them everything that the collector would want them to do. What do you tell them? Okay. Well, I think there are some things that universally all collectors would agree are good, right? So when we see Immaculate Football from Collegiate come out this season and it's Trey Lance's card with a patch not associated with him and it's the patch of the wrong college, I think all collectors can agree that that's bad, right? So I think patches that aren't associated with the player need to go in general. I, I think a lot of these products need to try to be working hard to be doing game-worn patches. And the same thing with sticker autos. Obviously, I want you know, on-card autos, but that's not always possible all the time for every release. But, you know, try to make more on-card autos. I, I think stuff like that is a good start. And I think some other things is to make more stuff numbered in general. I think 50 billion parallels for every single release. It feels like we have every single animal print possible in select cards now, right? Like, it's just, they just think of the next animal print to do, and now that's the new chase card. Like, I, I, I think it was, if you look at older releases and stuff, there was less parallels, and I think sometimes less is more. And... I, I think just rarity in general, quality, I, I think a lot of collectors in general would overwhelmingly be excited about that. So it's less interesting is more. hearing a 21 year old think like this, right? Like it's funny, like you ask oh, oh, people that have been in the hobby for four decades, they'll be like, there's way too many parallels. You ask a 21 year old who's been in the hobby three years, there's too many parallels, but yet they keep making a ton of parallels. <laughs> what do you think? What do you think fanatics would say though? Because, you know, we can summarize it as this. I, we, you guys just spent all these billions of dollars to get the license on the cards. But you know what you got to do? You got to make less. Like, how are they going to make money? You got to make less. So then there's going to be less, and it's going to cost more money so that they can make their bottom line. And doesn't that edge out a whole segment of the, of the collectors, of, of the consumers? does that edge out the people who don't have the big bankrolls? The people like you who came in a year ago who didn't have a big bankroll? Because now Fanatics brand has everything you want as a collector. It's got less parallels. It's got a lot of numbered cards. It's on-card autos. It's only game used. And every box costs $5,000. Well, look, I, I think we need to differentiate. Like, like some products, I think it's good when there are some products that younger collectors get. Like I want a 10-year-old kid to be able to open a box of cards, right? I don't think that kid has to be able to get a National Treasures box for Christmas, right? Like I, I think, I, I think low-end releases, but I think you do need to differentiate like low-end releases. And then when we get the real stuff and it's a LaMelo Ball National Treasures RPA that we're going to see going golden auctions for $200,000, you know what? That pack should have some association with it. It shouldn't be not associated with the player. I, I think stuff like that is just, just, and yeah, obviously if you're Fanatics or if you're Panini or Tops right now, you know you're losing your license, they're going to print cards like crazy. But I would hope from Fanatics, if they're trying to think that they're going to attack the industry from a bunch of different angles, that, that their number one focus isn't just printing as many cards. So I think once people realize that Miles Bridges is actually a better player than Lanella Ball, the value of those autos is actually going to go up. <laughs> Who Going into the season, let's talk a little bit of basketball. I know you're a huge basketball fan. You know, what are you looking forward to? Yeah, so I'm, I'm a big LeBron guy. I, I feel like I've been defending LeBron ever since I was like a five-year-old kid. So to see LeBron go into a season right now where it feels like almost everybody believes that he's not the best basketball player in the world anymore – that makes me really excited. I'm a big Anthony Davis guy too. I love seeing him outside of the top ten on MVP list. I was at the, I was doing videos of the national stuff, 
Anthony Davis, I believe, was the biggest buy three months ago, and his stuff has already been trending up, but I believe it's going to continue to go up because I think Anthony Davis is going to probably win MVP this season. Might be a hot take, but Lakers are the best wow. team to last by far. And, yeah, I would say for me That's personally – hot take on top of hot take. So keep, keep going. I like this. Yeah, look, the Lakers are going to win the West easily this season. And for the people that believe Luka is going to win MVP, I, I don't see how it's possible, given the fact that it's probably under a 10% chance they're a top four seed in the West. So that'll be interesting because people love to – a lot of people love to hate on LeBron very quickly for anything. Everybody loves to throw, this guy's better than LeBron, this guy's better than LeBron. It's going to be interesting right now when it's year four for Luka and he still doesn't have a playoff series win. Well, it's not just LeBron versus Luka. There, there's a whole gamut of other players out there in the West. Yeah. No, I don't think so. Kawhi's not playing Kawhi, Kawhi's not playing the season, or at least for a long part of the season, so the Clippers aren't going to be competitive. You think Donovan Mitchell and the Utah Jazz – are going to be able to beat him? You you're you're forgetting about literally the reigning MVP. Jokic without Jamal Murray? It doesn't matter. They have Michael Porter-Jesus. They don't need Murray. Murray can just stay home. Michael Porter-Jesus is the greatest player. He's going to win the MVP. Yeah, I, I saw I saw in the bubble Jokic be unstoppable, Jamal Murray be unstoppable, and the Lakers still beat their eyes closed. That, that's what I remember. <laughs> so we, we, we can talk all games, but when you have LeBron – if you have LeBron James healthy – Nobody in the West is beating them. And the only team I'll even give you the light of day to think that they could beat the Lakers is the Nets. And now their one superstar isn't going to be able to play half the season. So sounds sounds like sounds like ring number five for LeBron. So LeBron collectors, Anthony Davis collectors, this is going to be a fun uh, seven months for you back to say that. Listen, I mean, he's confident. And I got to tell you, uh, the West, you know, the Lakers were the best team in the West last year, but they didn't come out. Right, so that's the only the only thing is you could you could be the best team and not and not actually advance. LeBron's just been the best forever. I don't know how he hasn't won a championship every single year that he's been in the league. Well, he's got some outside great, his rookie year. He's got some really great talent around him. I mean, Westbrook is not going to turn the ball over this much in the regular season as he has been so far in the preseason. But I mean, this it, it's old talent, but he's got some some pretty significant talent around. You can't deny that. And to say that they're the favorites to come out of the West, I don't think that's a hot take. Anthony Davis winning the MVP might it's, be it's not. It's not a hot take. Look at the Vegas odds. Yeah. No, nobody, nobody's giving you good odds. Of course, they all, right. Everybody believes that the Lakers are going to come out. But Anthony now, Davis winning the MVP, that's a hot take. Just because it's tough. It's tough. So it's tough to win the MVP on a team that that's stacked. Right? You know what I mean? Like It's difficult to vote for a guy when he already has – what some people think is the best player of all time on the team with him, supporting him. Then, you know, you got also Carmelo and Russell Westbrook and, and, you know, like it's basically a, 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 an all-star team, you know, Dwight Howard, so, you know, so it, it's tough to, to say, all right, you know, we're going to, he would have to outperform everybody on that team, like by, by a mile. That's what you're expecting for him this year. You, you want to know who's third all time in PR and NBA history? Yeah, Andrew likes that stuff. I can't even spell Anthony, PER. Anthony Davis. A Anthony Davis will put up 28 and 10 and be probably so the best defensive player in the league with his eyes. I love having you on because here's why. Every time he brings up PER now, every time Andrew brings up PER, we're like, yeah, dude, it's a ridiculous stat. If PER mattered, Anthony Davis would be the third best player of all time. So it doesn't okay, matter. Pause, pause real quick. <laughs> Insert cue. I've never talked about PER on the show, so just keep going. <laughs> no, the, the, the 36 minutes. Her 36 uh, minutes is not PER. Two different so. things. Yeah. What's he per 36 minutes, Anthony Davis? Is he second? <laughs> well, well, yeah, PER is your efficiency. So it just shows that, like, what yeah, Anthony does in the game is a lot more valuable than what a lot of other people do. So, but there's a lot of things that are missing there, like the fact that he misses a lot of games and misses a lot of time in games because he can't seem to stay healthy. And 100%. 100%. So, I mean, all right. So it's it's fun stats. We got, we got, we got, I love it, man. I'd love to have you back on when Anthony Davis wins the MVP. That's good. I don't, I don't think we've had anybody else predict that. I will say her though, 36 minutes. Uh, do we do we want this stat or is it? Yeah, relevant? you can. That would be great. No, I definitely want to hear Anthony it. Davis. Yes, her 36 or yeah, 20 24 points a game, 1.8 well, blocks, last 1. season, his steals. Points per game was a lot lower than than his like career average. So the year before was 27.3. Well, I mean that's not terrible, but I will give you this. I kind of agree with you on Luca. I think this is kind of like a a put up or shut up year for for Luca as far as you know what's he gonna do. Um, and he doesn't really have much of a supporting cast around them, and there are teams that are significantly better than him. I think you're right that you know, for him to be a a a home game, a home series in the playoffs, it's going to be tough, and it's tough to pick somebody as the MVP in the league when you're you know you're going to be on the road for the first 
round of the playoffs. I, I'm with you. I, I mean, I mean, he could also average a 35 point triple double this year, and and it really, you know, it won't matter um, if he's that far ahead and shoulders of everybody else. But it's interesting how the hobby cherry picks people that they want to compare, but they leave out others who are like drastically better. Well, like Giannis, like, st- like you, Frank, Frank, Frank. You're 21 years old. You grew up during maybe one of the greatest basketball eras, in my opinion, and the greatest teams. And you didn't even mention this team. So, like, to me, it's fascinating that it's not even a discussion that Steph Curry is on, on the radar. You know, like, it, it's not even a name on, on your, you know, roadmap. Like, it's fat. Clay Thompson, another guy. Like, this is a great team out West that it doesn't seem like you guys are all interested in, in discussing them. Yeah, I, w- I would say – as a LeBron fan and watching what the Warriors did, beating LeBron multiple times, I'm probably a little biased against him. But I will say that if we're talking about Steph Curry potentially being MVP, I think him not making the postseason last year shows that is he really the most valuable player in basketball? Obviously, Steph Curry is incredible. Second best point guard of all time. That's awesome. But They, they that was, played your LeBron Lakers, and your Lakers beat them by three points. And, 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 Le, and LeBron was – what was LeBron? 60%? What was LeBron? 60%? What do you mean? Um, from, the, from the free throw line, he is right around that 60%. <laughs> he's actually trending down. Uh, uh, like, uh, he's he, – maybe he'll hit 50 this year. Listen, here's the answer on, on Curry and the Warriors. I think the, the that's a wait and see. Like, they could surprise everybody and be a powerhouse. But, you know, Clay's got to actually stay on the court. You know, Steph's going to have to do what he did last year, which is basically put an entire team on his back. You got to see what the and, surroundings And play GM? Oh, no, no. That's LeBron just plays GM, and he brings everybody. <laughs> Come on over in L.A. Come hang with me. I'll, Dude, go, to, I'll go to senior citizen home for you guys. By the way, right my here. new favorite recipe for a show is bring a LeBron fan on for Andrew. It's, I, you cannot beat it. You cannot beat it. I love it. I love it. Listen, I, you can't really argue, Andrew. The, the Lakers so are the biased. But That's the Lakers the are – but they're favored to win the West. They are, right? And, and it – it would be a surprise if one of these other teams that has not really done it, right? The Suns, that was the easiest road they were ever going to have. Yeah, yes, yeah, they and, really and repeat. When LeBron was LeBron was sixty percent. When LeBron was sixty percent, LeBron did not look like himself last postseason. Ever says he heard that. You're talking about health, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, health. Gotcha. You could tell. You could tell that LeBron was not completely healthy in the postseason. He didn't have his burst or anything like he had. When I don't know, man. When he was doing that salsa dance thing that he was doing while he was unhealthy, he looked pretty healthy. Okay. In the salsa dance. One, one year, so- one year ago today, LeBron won the title. From oh. that point to the first half of his last NBA season, LeBron was the favorite or second favorite to win MVP. He then yep. rolls his ankle and he didn't look like himself. I love this. I love LeBron fans. When they lose, LeBron's team loses. When they win, LeBron wins. It's the opposite of leadership. Like if you were well, taught leadership in school, you would be taught how to be a leader. Like he's LeBron, saying, right? he got hurt and he was a shadow of himself. And I'll give him that. I mean, he rolled his ankle. He did look hurt. He was oh, wailing. He was all on the floor. Remember, he was doing the whole to do right. So listen, I mean, we have a healthy LeBron this year, and perhaps the, uh, you know, we we. LeBron has only one title. LeBron names MVP Davis to win a world well, championship. That, that's LeBron exactly, is the best you're player. exactly right. Like LeBron wins championships when he has a good supporting player to help. LeBron him win. also went to the NBA Finals with his next player being like, who? Oh, 2007. Who's the second best player on, on the Cavs in 2007? I, I don't. I, probably Mo, Mo Williams or Zadrunas. I mean, listen, Jim Kelly and Thurman Thomas went to four straight um, Super Bowls and lost two. Nobody seems to give a shit about them. Getting there and losing makes you second to Michael Jordan. Yeah, I guess he's also won four. He's been more than Jordan. He also came back from three one against the Golden State Warriors. And it's true, but you don't like the Warriors. That's the only. Uh, are, you, are you a Giannis fan at all? Uh, I'm not a Giannis hater. I respect Giannis. I, I think the championship makes me respect him. And I, I would say for the Anthony Davis take, the narrative now allows Giannis to win MVP because. He won MVP back-to-back years, and the media voted for him, and he embarrassed the media in the postseason by choking. Now that he proved that he could win the championship and he was phenomenal in the finals, now I have no problem with Giannis. Giannis got over the hurdle. And look, as a LeBron fan, I remember when I was younger, I was hearing the same exact things with LeBron that we just heard with Giannis. Oh, he can't win. And if Luka doesn't make it far in the postseason this year, I'm not going to hate on Luka. Was he a 22-year-old kid? LeBron didn't win the championship until he was 25, 26. Right. So – I'm not going to hate on Luca. I also think it's unfair that every single time Luca scores 30 points, I hear people comparing him to LeBron and stuff because I think that level of expectations are unrealistic. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I'm saying the, like it feels like there's a lot of people that just expect Luca to walk into being a top 10 player of all time. What's the percent chance that Luca has a better career than Kevin Durant? 
Listen, you're a hundred percent right, man. We talk about this all the time, but we, we, you know, we just pivoted. We were talking about Justin Herbert, right? And we did a show yesterday where I gave the numbers, the MVPs, the Super Bowls, the you know, the stats and the whole deal. I wasn't talking about Herbert, but it was a rug pull because I was actually given the stats in the line of Aaron Rodgers and how Aaron Rodgers had this, you know, the card was like basically nothing. It's less than what you'd pay for Herbert cards. And, you know, I'm sure Herbert would sign up to have the career that Rodgers had right now. He's on the dotted line. Same thing, Luca. You know, he'd, he'd probably sign up to have, you know, Kevin Durant's career or whatever it is. But people are pricing into the cards more than that. They're pricing in that he's going to do better than what LeBron did. So I'm, I'm with you, man. Trust me, I, I, I'm with you. And, and the more I watch LeBron, the more I, um, you know, respect the, the overall body of work that he's put out there. Um, it's understated. You know, it, it's underrated significantly what he's done. I mean, just if you're really a fan, just don't watch the Space Jam movie because you will not like it. I mean, he was horrible in Space Jam. I mean, he did a terrible job. But in what world that, is LeBron underrated? In, in the world we live in currently. Do you, think LeBron's the best, do you think LeBron's the best basketball player in the world? No. It's not to me. I, I've made this point. There's a clear number one, and they're oh. a flight for number two. Who's number one? Kevin Durant. I hope you say Kevin Durant. I hope you say Kevin Durant. The same guy that yes. airballed the shot. Are you, to, are you talking when about Jesse Jesse? I seven to shorter than him. Michael, no, we, Michael Jordan is the best. So no, Michael Jordan. No, playing. Yeah. He means playing right now. Oh, no. okay, okay. Oh, who's the best player in the league right now? Yeah. I, I, I would say I would. As crazy as this sounds, and I'm surprised that this is a hot take. I, how do you not give it to Jokic? He won the MVP last year. He had the best season out of anybody. Uh, if, if you're not going to give it to Jokic, you could give it to, to uh, Giannis. But it, to me, it's it's pretty clear cut. I agree. I agree. I it's, agree. It's pretty clear cut. The best player in the league right now is Devontae Graham. No doubt in my mind, guy can raise up, score 40. Michael Porter Jr. never did that. Well, Devontae uh, Graham's lucky that he gets to play alongside uh, Zion Williamson, who a year from now might be viewed as the best young player in the NBA. So I, I'm with you. Uh, I'm you happy believe that? He's, he's gotten uh, I'm, I'm a little a big, bit heavy. I'm a, I'm a big Zion guy, personally. Don't make fun of fat people, Andrew. Don't make fun of fat people. Mm -hmm. I knew you were going. You, you Dude, were looking I'm at me. I'm a fat person. I'm fat, man. My whole life I'm fat. Like <laughs> I, I, I've been a D1 athlete while being fat. I can never get skinny. I understand Zion's build. Uh, I train twice a day. I still can't lose weight. Are you worried about Zion's weight, though? Like, he's – if you look at his picture last year, this picture this year, his head is, like, 2.5x the size. Stop looking at the Panini cards. They don't do them – they do them wrong every time. I know uh, why Frank hates Panini because uh, – what, what I can tell you is that that was – it felt like heading into last NBA season, people were watching, like, every single game, assuming that Zion was going to have some catastrophic injury. I, I, I think it's overstated. Now, is Zion going to have a 20-year career like LeBron? Maybe not. Who knows? Maybe he's a star that has a shorter prime. Like guys like Russell Westbrook, guys like Dwayne Wade, you could tell those guys didn't age into their 30s the same way as some other people. But I also watched Zion Williamson last year. Let's not forget, he's about to have his third coach in three seasons. They've been incredibly dysfunctional. And the second half of last season, Zion Williamson averaged 30 points per game on like 65% effective field goal percentage, beyond efficient. And I think He's on a short list of guys that has a generational skill, which is he can go to the basket and nobody in the, in, in the NBA can stop him. And you could tell me that there's all these players that can do 10 different things. Well, Zion's one thing you can't stop. So I just hope he gets a little bit of help around him. I hope they let him bring up the ball a little bit more because I think he's a lot better than some of these other uh, young players that people are hyping up. So, so just real back to right back to who's the best player in the league right now, right? So most of the NBA looks at just offense, right? Are, are we going to take defense into consideration? I thought this was not? settled. Devontae Graham, done. Best player in the league. Frank, are we going to do defense <laughs> included in the best player in the NBA? Because that's important. Yeah, of course. I, I think so. So if it's if that's the case, I don't think that Jokic is the best. I think Giannis is the best. If we're going to go offense, defense. Yeah, but, Giannis is. Really good. But the problem with Giannis is the fact that if it's late in the game, if it's if there's 10 seconds left and they're down by one, he will not be involved in the play at all. I'm not saying he has to shoot the ball. LeBron doesn't always shoot the ball. LeBron makes the best read possible. But the problem is if you tell me that this guy is the best player in the world and he stands on the baseline hiding from the ball on the final plays of the game and you give it to Chris Middleton, I can't get behind that that's the best basketball player in the world. I'm you with him on this, too. by the way. I'm with him on this. You can't, you can't shoot free right. throws. You can't be involved in it. But, right. but, but you also can't pass to Danny Green. 
I mean, yeah, yeah you but can't. LeBron can't shoot free throws either, though. Like, all of these guys have little quirks. That's what made Jordan so great. For 10 years, he was the best offensive player, he was the best defensive player, and he was the most clutch guy. That's why when people even have a conversation of who's the best of all time, best offensive, best defensive, and most clutch player of all time. You know what LeBron's better at? At the end of his career, Jordan had to shave his head because he was going bald. LeBron somehow has regrown his hair towards the end of his career. It's amazing how he's done. It's like regeneration. I don't know if it's a cryo tank that he's in or something like that. That I give him credit for. He's better than Jordan at that, regrowing his hair. It's amazing. LaMelo or Lonzo, who would you invest in? <laughs> I, I, I would invest. In, I wouldn't invest. I, I'm actually a big fan of all the brothers. I've been a fan of them ever since they were high school, but I would not invest in either one of their cards. I, I, don't, I don't. Number one, the, the upside's gone with Lonzo. Like, there's no situation where three years from now, Lonzo Ball is just like a top 10 player in the NBA. That's gone. He's going to have a good role in the NBA. He's an above average player. That's cool. With LaMelo Ball, can either of you guys sit here and be confident that like two years from now, we're watching the playoffs and he's averaging like five points a game? Like, is he going to have, like, Luca postseasons, Trey postseasons? I don't know. I don't, I don't see the upside personally. I think he's not that athletic. I, that's, not, that's not a bold take. He isn't that athletic for a guard, and I don't trust his shooting and stuff. I think he shot better than he probably owned his rookie year until this year. And that's that. I don't, I don't see the upside there. I don't think he's going to be a generational talent. So, GMs. They lost Devontae Graham. I'm with you on that. They lost their best player. So the Hornets. Why do you like Devontae Graham so much? Because he's just awesome. He's just the best player on, on in the NBA right now. He just is. No, no, hands down. He's he when Zion can't play, they're gonna lean on Devontae and he's gonna light it up. Best player in the league. MVP, hot take. Go. Yeah, I, I think LaMelo cards are, are, are way too are way too expensive. I, I don't I I see literally zero upside. If if he ends up being exactly what you want to be, which is like a one in a million chance, maybe you don't lose all your money. Maybe you only lose like half of your money. How about from this, you know, last year's draft class? You know, it was an interesting draft class because it kind of reminded me of 2013. Uh, you maybe, you know, Patrick Williams is going to be the number one guy, you know, Wiseman. People have slept on him. Is there anybody you're excited about from this from last year's class that, that might be under the radar? I, I'm a Maxi fan, for, for example. We'll, we'll talk about the Sixers in a bit. Yeah. So as. As someone that's from Jersey, a lot of people like to say Emmanuel quickly. I, I disagree with that. I think what's going to happen this season is the exact same thing that happened in the car market with basketball last year, is where John Morant, the second best player in the class, started off amazing over the first couple of games, and everybody said he was just as good as Zion. And I think the same thing's going to happen with Anthony Edwards this year, that he's going to play well early on. He's going to look just as good, if not better, than LaMelo, and the same exact conversation is going to happen. But I think this time it's a lot more justified. I think the gap between like Anthony Edwards and LaMelo, I don't think it's much. I also think Anthony Edwards off the court, he's a great personality. People think he's funny. He's crazy athletic, so he's going to get the highlight plays. I think Anthony Edwards is like the one guy in that class that I would actually feel comfortable buying right now and thinking that his price is the whole. He reminds me a lot of a young Dwayne Wade. He reminds me of a lot of a very young uh, Flash. Yeah, D Wade Westbrook is just, yeah, crazy he's athletic. He's got hops, though. Yeah, I mean, he's got really good. I mean, so I, I, I like Edwards. A little dark horse, although obviously people already know him. I like Halliburton. I think his cards are a little low. I like Tyrese. He's, he's coming off an ACL, player. though, Cage, right? Mm-hmm. Is, is he, yeah, is he, he was injured? He was injured. I don't know. It was full ACL. I don't know what to, I mean, he was playing. I mean, he's playing in, like, the you know, the national team games. So I, I, mean, I don't like that. I don't like that take. You don't like Halliburton? How come? I, I think he's a decent player, but there's two problems. First problem is he plays on the Kings. And yeah, that's the worst. To help anybody. De'Aaron Fox is incredible, and nobody in the card market talks about him whatsoever. And number two, they are pretty deep, right? You have Everything's going to run through De'Aaron Fox. Now they got Davion Mitchell. They have Buddy Heald still. So what's Tyrese Halliburton going to average? You're not going to average 20 points a game. Um, I think he can come close to 20. I think p- because of that depth, people are going to start talking about him this year. I think they might make a little noise. Now, not not winning – yeah, maybe, I, you know, maybe they're the 13th seed instead of the 14th seed. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll, see. Level up. we'll see. So um, you were the, you, you're named the GM of the Sixers. You know, what do you do? Oh. Uh, well, first, I would fire Doc, uh, first, I would fire Doc Riffers because he blows more 3-1 leads than anybody else. Uh, <laughs> well, they, they handled the situation poorly. And right before I came on this, I was talking to one of my friends, and he was, like, so surprised that Ben Simmons wants to leave Philly. They literally lost the series. And everybody in the postgame trashed on Ben Simmons. Doc Rivers sat at the podium and said, yeah, I don't know if I can win a championship with Ben Simmons. Like, I, I don't know. 
they they lost all their leverage. Ben Simmons isn't seen as a valuable asset right now. It's not like they can go trade him for Damian Lillard or something like that. So if I was the GM of the Sixers, I would, I guess I would hope that Ben Simmons shows up to camp, plays well for the first month or two, trade him before the trade deadline and move on. I, I think that's the best situation. I, I think for Ben Simmons cards, I was actually saying this like a, a month and a half ago, they got so cheap to the point where there actually was value just waiting for the trade to happen because it's going to happen inevitably. He's not staying in their market. Yeah. I agree with you there. I think Ben Simmons, you buy them low. You know, at this point in their career, where as long as Ben Simmons played, do you know how many people have averaged seven points, seven assists through this point in their career? You can't stop it at seven. Like seven points is what? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, excuse me, seven rebounds, seven rebounds. My apologies, seven rebounds, seven assists. Probably not those, that many. That's good numbers, right? So not that many. Oscar Robinson, Magic Johnson. Ben, ben Simmons is an above average point guard. He's 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 good. Yeah, 100%. so I mean Ben Simmons is maybe the worst player I've ever seen in my entire Simmons. life. And him. and what's hilarious is his cards are actually not as cheap as you would think. That, like, yeah, they were. They they I would up. sell I'm thinking of the office episode where uh Andy's trying to sell his Xterra to Dwight. And Dwight's like, I would not use this for anything. This will be on my farm and towed by donkeys. I will pay you next to nothing. That's what I would pay for a Ben Simmons card. But his cards are actually two hundred dollars for a PSA ten. For yeah. a base prism PSA ten, I, I would. There's, that. I, I there's would a thousand three hundred of them. No, no. no the, the, I I remember right when they got eliminated. I remember there was a decent amount of auctions of like low, like low numbered prism stuff and all that stuff, which actually were ending for not that much money. They were ending in like the eight hundred dollars, seven hundred dollars range for like really rare stuff. That that I would take a flyer on base prisms for two hundred dollars for Ben Simmons. I, I would. Do that. All right. So I mean, I, I love young kids like this who are passionate, excited. They're like, I'm going to make a name for myself in in, in basketball and sports cards. What what's the future hold for Frank? You know, what do you want to you want to be a GM of the Nets? Uh, you know, you want to run you know ESPN. What, what do you got going on? What are you thinking? Uh, my, my goal is I, I would say to wake up every single morning and be excited about what I want to do. So, so for right now, that sports cards, sports cards has been like a blessing to me over the last year, being able to, you know, build it, like build this, obviously turn into something that I could provide for myself at the exact same time, make really good relationships. So I don't know how long I'm going to be doing sports cards. You know, I, I love building the brand. I love interacting with people in the, in the space, but I don't know. I, I would say my goals are more so like starting businesses and stuff down the line. I don't really think about having like a position in sports or something like that, but Andrew, I mean, other than the LeBron take, this guy reminds me of a younger you. You got a lot of similarities here. This whole, like, wake up and be happy with what you're doing, don't have a boss, like, I want to start businesses. There's a lot of you here, which is funny because prior to doing sports and content and you, you know, introducing me to what a podcast was, Andrew, thank you very much for that, um, I never met anybody like this. And now it's like, the, you know, the, the hobby is it, it, we're chock full of people who are like, you know, damn the man. I am not going to work for somebody. I am not going to struggle to be middle management. I'm going to go make a name of myself, and I, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, succeed or fail on my own sweat. So more power to you, Frank. I mean, uh, it's great to meet you. It's great to hear from you. Um, a couple quick ones. One, you know, Andrew mentioned Capri, which is the old. One. Where can people find you? And two, what do you got coming up? Because I know I'm wearing a Star Stock hat. I know you got something coming up with Star Stock. So let's talk about that for a minute. Let's tell people where they can find your your content, your page, and let's talk about the Star Stock stuff for a second. Yeah. So to find us, you know, follow me at Find Your Trove on Instagram. From there, you can get linked. I, I would recommend everybody signs up for the free daily emails. Completely free. Uh, it's not like I have one of those programs guaranteed you're going to triple your money. Just give me like fifty dollars a month. <laughs> I'm, I'm not taking any money from anybody. But yeah, and stuff that I'm doing, I'm really excited to announce that we're doing breaks every Friday with Starstock. Uh, this Friday, we're going to be breaking a 2014 Excalibur premium box, which has kabooms and stuff. And I'm really excited uh, to work with this with Starstock for two main reasons. First, you know, a lot of breakers just break the same boxes. Every single night I go on my Instagram live, I see Prism Basketball, Optic Basketball. But to work with them to find really cool boxes that you don't see broken very often, I, I think is really cool. So next week, we're doing a 2013 Fleer Retro which is where you could get uh, Giannis rookie cards, like the Giannis PMG, Giannis Autos, LeBron, Jordan Autos, cool stuff like that. And also for breaking in general, we haven't worked with anybody in the space that does breaking. But what made me excited about Starstock is the fact that it like reduces a lot of friction by the fact that they can vault your cards and you can sell in the marketplace. Because I know a lot of people that join breaks, like 99% of the cards that they pull in the break, they don't actually want. Right. So the fact that they can just be in your Starstock, like in your account. And I, I use this personally. A lot of my friends do. 
literally you just sell them easily on the marketplace and recoup some of your cash from the break. And then the cars that you really want, you can keep. So I'm excited about it. I think it's gonna be fun. And that's that. Yeah, I mean, listen to those boxes. Fleet Retro with PMGs. You talk about Excalibur. A lot of people like these kaboom things. I think they're a little nuts. But obviously, what do you I'm collect, Frank? What, what do you have in like in your collection? You know, if you did like that pie chart, you know, vintage basketball. Like, how would you break that down? What's your allocation? Yeah, so I'm I'm sure when I get to this in a little while, you guys gonna think there's some more hot takes in here coming. But, nice. We like but, that. But this man. is your own personal collection. This is where your money is. So like, I can't judge that. I could judge you saying something. You know, Anthony Davis is going to be MVP. I'm like, I don't agree with that, but. I don't think you're a bad person at all. For yeah. So, so for basketball, the majority of my money is in LeBron. I, I think that makes sense based on our discussion. So yeah. Rookies, to- or, rookies or, you know, second, third year kind of refractors. So a lot of the LeBron stuff I bought, I bought like a year or so ago. So it is rookies like top stage rookie, like PSA 10 and stuff like, like just like base flagship stuff. Yeah. But yeah, but my, my goal is and what I'm planning on doing, and I've just been trying to look for the right stuff is yeah, to you know, consolidate and buy like autos and stuff. And then Anthony Davis, I, I got one RPA of his trying, trying to get some more because I, we obviously know it's going to be a big season for him. And my football play where I stashed up uh, some autos is uh, Deshaun Watson. Been buying his numbered Prism Auto PSA 10s for pennies on the dollar. And I, I like the value proposition there. First reward. We're not so different after all. Even though I don't own Deshaun Watson, uh, we haven't talked about him a ton on the show for obvious reasons. I mean, I guess legal proceedings and all that stuff, but I get too uh, legal. Won- and brings it up, and I'm like, no, no, we gotta do legal. And he's like, all right, we're telling this whole episode because you just went lawyer on it. And I'm like, okay, you know. So yeah, well, it's a are. shame. He's he's a he's a great quarterback, and uh, he had that whole situation, and it's kind of still up in the air, right? Like no one knows. I don't think there's ever even been any news in one direction or another. So yeah, I, I've been a huge, I, I've been a big fan of his ever since he was in college, and when I wanted to buy his stuff. It was like really expensive in February and March of this year. His stuff got really hot in anticipation of a trade. And then all the allegations came out and I was looking at people selling numbered autos, RPAs. The stuff I bought was 15 to 20% of what it was three weeks prior, right? Like the prices, I remember the one prism numbered auto I bought sold for $5,000 and I bought it like two or three weeks later for like 1200 bucks to one card, right? That card right now for Kyler Murray, like the blue wave prism auto PSA 10, that's like a $3,000 card for Kyler Murray and stuff. So my only bet is if Deshaun Watson ever steps on the field ever again, I am making money. And that car, and like the couple Deshaun Watson autos that I bought, they haven't sold for less than what I paid for them. So I think it's risky, obviously, but I think taking calculated risks makes sense sometimes. I like it. It's- what are other shoes you have on your wall? Anything cool? Any, uh, you know, Air Force, Air Force Ones, Jordans? What do you got over there? Got a couple uh, foam posits, foam posits. A lot, a lot of that's like Nike basketball stuff from when I was hooping and stuff. So like Kobe's, LeBron's and stuff like that. A, little, a couple of Jordan 11s and stuff, but mostly Nike basketball and Air Maxes and stuff. Who's your game like? Like if you, if you could pick like a, an NBA player we all know, like who, who, did you play in college? No. You played high school, high school ball and AAU and, and growing up. Like who's your game? I'm going to guess. D- Dino Raja. Not a little too tall. I actually have like a Dino Raja thing right on my wall right there, actually. <laughs> not, not not tall enough to be him but i don't know more, more i was a true guard like shooting stuff so i don't know probably like a okay. poor man's clay or something like that off ball let tyler, it fly. tyler hero but you, you yeah, have some tyler hands. Was a little more on ball i was more off ball let it fly duncan robinson give me a duncan robinson take something like that Dude, Dude, duncan robinson is doing good things with his brand too i don't know if people realize like he, he he's has a good his podcast. Own podcast yeah i like his podcast jimmy new his story man dude his story is awesome i think he was like but, Go ahead. He, he went to Williams College, played Division three basketball, then transferred to Michigan. And then there was a thing where his last year at Michigan, he didn't think he was going to make the NBA. And there was, like, screenshots that he had where he was, like, getting in contact with alumni to help him find a job. And now you find him, like, in the NBA finals playing against LeBron just a couple years later. Yeah. Stuff he, was like calling, he was calling Dave Portnoy, huh? He was like, hey, Portnoy, I want to get a job at Barstool. I, I love stories like that. That stuff gets me hyped up. There you go. What Listen, do you think of Space Jam, too? He loved it. Best watch. movie ever. Won the I Academy Award. I didn't watch it. <laughs> Come on. You got to watch it. Listen, in defense of LeBron, Michael Jordan was terrible in the original Space Jam 2. I'm the biggest Jordan fan you're going to find, card-wise, <laughs> you know, legacy-wise. But Space Jam 1 was terrible, too. People romanticize about that movie, make it like it was something good. They were both Space terrible. Space Jam 1 was terrible? Yeah, it was terrible, too, man. I mean, Michael Jordan's not an actor. Well, the, well Bill, with Bill Murray? Yeah, Bill Murray was silly in it, too, you know? I mean, no, that, movie, you know. that movie was okay. It, it, it gets the job done. Yeah, that, 
<laughs> it, people, if you haven't watched that movie, watch it and let me know what you think. <laughs> Give it a real grade. Not, not, and I'm a Jordan guy. <laughs> it's, it's a little silly. It's a little silly. So it is what it is. It's no, uh, it's no John Wick. I got to give you credit because I, I um, we have done like 460 episodes here, and I, I don't really jump off like jump through the screen. <laughs> you, you you handled your own. I mean, you, you probably I mean, play a little bit of poker. Me. Yeah, you probably play a little poker. You're you're unfazed, unrattled. You're just like I'm ready to rock. So I respect that. I respect here, that a here's lot. Here's what I take away from this: I am not signed up for this email, and I am going to stop recording, and I'm going to sign up for this kid's email, and everybody else who's listening should as well, because obviously he knows what he's talking about, and he's got some really good ideas here, and some that I wouldn't think of myself, like you know the Deshaun Watson investment. You know, you know, that's not exactly scared money. Don't make no money. It's more of a calculated risk. It's got some risk to it, but it's got potential high reward. Um, you know, and if if there's that type of stuff in there mixed in with the Anthony Davis winning the MVP type of stuff. It's the kind of stuff I want to read about. So it's And it's cool. free. Like I, I that was one of the things like we've always wanted to keep our content free because you know if you're so good at making money on sports cards, why do you have to make money off your community? Right? I've never understood that concept. So we've always wanted to keep our content free. And you said that like our newsletter is completely free. Our content's completely free. You're just doing it to educate the community. So I, I respect that because I know how much work it takes, right? A lot of people think it like you just put it out and it's like you go along. No, it takes a lot of time to, to make sure all this stuff happened, make the wheels turn. So respect. Did you go to college? Uh, I'm a senior right now. I go to Seton Hall. Nice. nice. Pirates. Pirates. Luther Wright. Luther Wright. That was the first round draft pick when I when I was watching Seton Hall in the 90s. 93, 94. Luther Wright. They were good back in the day. They've been good the last few years too. But yeah, finishing out school and keep working in cards. Make some magic happen. Love it. So when can they find you on Star Stock, and we'll let you go? What do you mean? When? This Friday, next oh, Friday? Oh, yeah. This first break is, yeah, it's going to be like every Friday night for the next few months we're going to do a break. Yeah, 9 p.m. Eastern, uh, I'll be on the live of Star Stock. The breaks are live. The three breaks that we're doing in October are all live. Uh, you can join up for those right now. Sweet. Love Thank it. you. Thanks, Frank. You're good spirits, Frank. This was fun. Thank you guys for having me.